Welcome to lecture 16 of Statistical Rethinking 2023. You think back to very early in the course when I introduced Gaussian models and linear regression. I told the story about how many different micro arrangements of coin tosses on a football field, a soccer field, will inevitably produce approximately Gaussian distribution. This is a very common phenomenon in statistics and in science in general, and really in nature, is that uh, there are many little micro causes of the state of the system, but the macro state of the system can be largely insensitive uh, to those details. And so in this case, there are many different unique sequences of coin tosses that will result in the same position on the field, and there are vastly more sequences that will put individuals near the center line, then far away from it. And this phenomenon produces inevitably Gaussian distributions. Uh, this is a really important sort of phenomenon, this distinction between micro-level causes and macro-level states, because it often makes it possible to do inference. I mean, on the one hand, it means that we can't look at a normal distribution and know what happened at the micro-level. Uh, but it also means it allows us to average over those microstates and learn things about relationships between entities at larger scales. So in this lecture, we're going to extrapolate this basic phenomenon uh, and make uh, really good use of normal distributions again to study processes at very large scales. So in the previous lecture, we were in Nicaragua and we studied sharing. And now we're going to go to the other side of the world. Uh, and work to the Pacific, and return to the Oceanic Societies example from earlier in the course, and we're going to be worried about the confounds that arise from the spatial relationships uh, of these societies. Oceanic societies are separated by large bodies of water, but they've never been isolated from one another. Well, except maybe Hawaii, uh, as we'll see. Uh, and also there are geographical similarities among societies that are closer together just due to the um, uh, geology uh, of the islands they live on. And I had neglected to deal with those confounds previously, but now we have more equipment in, in our toolkit and we're ready to do it. So we're going to return to the Oceanic Technology data set, and uh, there's another version of it called Klein 2 in the Rethinking Package that has some additional data tables, and so we'll be working with that version. Uh, to remind you, in this, in this uh, project, we're interested in understanding how the number of tool types in a society is related to population size, because many different models of the evolution of technology uh, have population size as a, a big driver, because it manages the innovation rate. Uh, basic problem in this uh, inference is that there are lots of other things that can also influence um, technology that you find in a society. Like, uh, for example, islands that are close together will share their technology and also share other unobserved confounds like raw materials that are available or the sorts of challenges they need to overcome. So here's a uh, visit the DAG that we saw earlier. Uh, we have the outcome of interest is the number of tools. That's the complexity of the toolkit. These are historical toolkits, right? And uh, we're interested in uh, population as a so-called treatment. That is what's the influence of population size on an equilibrium of complexity of a toolkit. Um, previously, we had tried to deal with some of the uh, spatial uh, confounding issues with this binary coded contact variable um, and acknowledge that there were a bunch of unobserved confounds that would influence both population size and the complexity of the toolkit, uh, but we were going to ignore them in the previous lecture, and we did. Now we're going to try and deal with that. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, there are many different histories of interaction and many different things that could make toolkits on neighboring islands similar. Um, but we don't necessarily need to understand all that detailed history to deal with that confounding statistically. And that's what we're going to develop in the first part of this lecture. To remind you, this is the model we had settled on in the previous lecture. This is a dynamic model of toolkit evolution, a simple cultural evolutionary model where the change in the number of tools uh, per unit time is um, 
equal to some innovation rate alpha times the population size to some exponent beta, which governs the diminishing returns. Each additional person does not have the same um, impact on innovation, but less of an impact is the idea. <clears throat> and then we sub the tools are lost at some rate uh, gamma. So we subtract um, uh, at the end of that equation. And then I showed you that we can solve this equation for an equilibrium rate of tools, t bar, uh, shown at the bottom of this slide. And that will be our expectation um, uh, to examine in the data. And that's just review. That's what we did before. How do we get um, space into this? The fact that some islands are closer to one another, and so we expect their deviations from this expectation from t hat. That little circumflex over the t is called a hat. Um, how do we get the expectation that closer islands will be more similar and how they deviate from that expectation? How do we get that into the model? Here's the idea. Uh, this is an area of statistics we think of as spatial covariation or spatial confounding. Islands close to one another share confounds, and they, all, uh, and they also share innovations, which in this sense is kind of like um, uh, a confound. And uh, the effect of this unobserved uh, uh, confound is to make closer islands more similar to one another. So let's develop a model where we ignore population for a moment, just so this is easy. Now, remember, in, in the second half of the course especially, but definitely in your own research, uh, the models are sufficiently complicated, the generative models and the statistical models, the estimators, that you don't want to build them all at once. You want to take them in steps and test each step and make sure you understand it. And along the way, often you learn things that will lead you to revise your plan. Uh, but so we do it step by step, first of all, so it works. So we do quality assurance. And secondly, because there are real intellectual benefits of doing it step by step for understanding uh, what the model means. So in this example, we're going to start with something that doesn't have population in it at all. We're just going to model the spatial covariation among the islands as a, as a function of their distance from one another. Now, how do we do this? Well, it's going to be a varying intercepts model, like you've seen in previous lectures. But the uh, prior on these intercepts is going to be strange. So let's, I'll take this step by step, and I think you're going to like it. So uh, we have tools, uh, t sub i, a Poisson variable with some rate lambda for each society i. And we're going to do this GLM style with log lambda, uh, just the most basic sort of varying intercept model you can think of. And we have some mean alpha bar across all islands. That's just an average com tool kit complexity. And then each society s get some deviation from that. And that's what these alpha sub s bracket i's are. Nothing new so far. These are varying effects. So we're going to do partial pooling on them. Um, and we need a vector, therefore, of all of them. Uh, and there are 10 societies in this particular data set. But if you had a bigger data set, it would be a longer vector. Uh, the model would work the same. And of course, we give this a multivariate normal prior. Um, we're going to sample them all at once. Well, I shouldn't say, of course, uh, we're going to do this thing that we hadn't quite done before. We're going to put all of these into a multivariate normal prior, and we're going to model the covariance among these intercepts the same way we had modeled the covariance among features in the previous lecture on correlated varying effects. Uh, and the reason we're going to do this is this is going to let us smuggle distance, uh, how far apart islands are, into the model. So um, we have a, the mean of this multivariate normal is all zeros because these are offsets from alpha bar. And then we have this big covariance matrix, capital K here. Uh, so this is often called a kernel. Um, so that's we use K for kernel. And what does this covariance matrix look like? Well, it's horrifying. It looks like this. Uh, it's a 10 by 10 covariance matrix. Um, it's symmetric, so I'm only drawing the upper triangle. Uh, the diagonal is all variances, those sigma squareds, and uh, then there's a unique covariance between every pair of islands in this thing, and there are 10, right? So altogether, we've got 45 covariances to estimate. We've only got 10 data points. Yeah, uh, not a lot of hope there, uh, but here's a cool trick. <clears throat> we don't have to estimate all of these covariances independent of one another, because we actually think if space is what's leading to covariation, there will be a lot of structure among these different covariances. And so we want to model them as a function of space. And that means we will need many fewer parameters. We don't need 45. 
Uh, here's the, the idea. This is a technique known as Gaussian processes, yet another term uh, that indicates that statisticians should never make up terminology. What does this mean? Uh, a Gaussian process, if you look it up on Wikipedia, is defined as an infinite dimensional generalization of multivariate normal distributions. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, what does that mean? The idea is, uh, just as I tried to explain on the previous slide, instead of a conventional covari covariance matrix in which every correlation is free uh, outside the constraints of being a valid correlation matrix, we're going to use a kernel function, uh, that's, which it just means some function that determines the entries in the covariance matrix using a small number of parameters and some predictor variable. So it's a way of putting predictors inside the covariance matrix uh, and having a smaller number of parameters and regularizing uh, the varying effects that, are, that come out of this kernel. Uh, the reason it says um, uh, that it's an infinite dimensional uh, generalization is because, well, it is. Once you have the kernel function, the covariance matrix can get arbitrarily large, uh, in principle infinitely large, uh, because that doesn't add any new parameters. Yeah, uh, it's an infinite dimensional um, uh, uh, normal distribution. Uh, you can you can predict for new cases that are at any arbitrary distance. One way to think about this is you just pick a point in the Pacific Ocean, and this model will make a prediction for how similar uh, society at that point should be to all the other societies uh, without adding any parametric complexity to the model at all. And that's what we mean by infinite dimensional, that in principle it will make a uh, prediction for an infinite number of points um, at any arbitrary distance from the other points. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to use distance um, as the uh, observational input into the kernel function, and we're going to—I'll I'll show you what the kernel functions are in a moment. Um, but in principle, it doesn't have to be distance. In this case, it is because we have a spatial confounding problem. There are islands on the surface of the Earth, um, but it could be anything else. It could be differences in any kind of variable. Right? It could be differences in age. Age is a, a funny variable because we expect individuals of similar age to share similar unobserved confounds, um, but we, uh, we expect that similarity to decline as the difference in age increases. Uh, so again, uh, this is a, a kind of nice way to deal with age effects too and cohort effects. Uh, space is the one we're focusing on now, but also time is, is a kind of distance, uh, and many other things uh, have this kind of flavor to them as well. The way you want to think about all of these problems is that these are continuous ordered categories, yeah, distances and ages and, and, uh, and times. Um, and we want to do partial pooling because we like regularization, but we want um, points that are closer to one another to pool more with one another. So <clears throat> I'm going to spend a few slides now going through the abstract version of Gaussian processes so that you understand it in a a more graphical geometric way and then we're going to come back to the oceanic tools data set but put the put the tools aside for a moment and we're just going to think about gaussian processes in the abstract and and i know uh lots of people when they're starting out in this business you don't like abstractions you like solid examples um, but but part of the skill in this business is getting comfortable with the abstraction so that you can use the tools across contexts yeah uh, so indulge me i think this is a, a kind of thing you want to get used to doing so we're going to think about on this slide some arbitrary x-axis variable, and it, it could be um, location, uh, it could be age, it's it's something uh, some kind of continuous ordered uh, category, and, and then a y-axis variable, uh, which is some measurable response um, uh, from from the units in this. Uh, it could be toolset kits, it could be political attitudes if you're a political scientist, and the x-axis variable is age, for example. Um, and then on the on the left, I'm showing you there's one data point, uh, that black circle in the middle labeled one, and that's the only observation we have so far. And then those squiggly lines, uh, the, the blue, the red, and the cyan lines, those are possible functions which describe the relationship between x and y. And the thing about Gaussian processes is we consider an infinite number of functions, basically all the functions, uh, with no particular parametric shape, just any old continuous function um, that passes through the points. <clears throat> and uh, on the right, I'm showing you the kernel function, which specifies uh, 
uh, the covariance at any given distance between points. I'll say that again. What the kernel function does is it specifies the expected covariance between points, um, between the points on the curve, yeah, at a given distance. So right now we only have one point, uh, but we can uh, you think about animating this and sampling from the prior and this covariance function you see, since there's only one point, it's anchored at that point, but the curves can do anything elsewhere. But then we observe a second point, number two here, and it anchors the curve in another location. Uh, and then you can see what the kernel uh, density function uh, uh, does in describing this, um, uh, these functions is there's a distance between points one and two. And I've tried to label this with the uh, red line segment. And we can put that same red line segment on the x-axis of the plot on the right. And uh, this is the distance between the two points. Yeah. Uh, and then what the kernel function says is the expected covariance between two points that have that distance from one another is given by that kernel function by the black curve on the right. Um, and that's the y-axis on the plot on the right. And what this does is it also applies to all of the unobserved points. And so now this constrains those wiggly functions. I'm going to start animating them again in a moment. Just hang on. It constrains them so that they can't wiggle as much when they're closer together at small ranges. It, it constrains how wiggly they can be, that the rate at which they can change in local space is one way to think about it. Uh, but I like the word wiggly. Yeah, sounds very good and scientific, right? So I'll start animating this again. You'll see that they uh, wiggle way less uh, between the two points. Um, those points are not as free to move, and they wiggle much more further on. And as we add more and more points, uh, here's a third point, we get more constraint, right? We learn more about the function. And the kernel function is what determines how much these curves can bend between the known points. Yeah, how wiggly uh, the functions are allowed to be. Uh, and every pair of points has an implied covariance. And that's what we're seeing uh, on the right when I draw the 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. It's good to watch these a bit. Uh, back up and, and look at these slides again, uh, if you like, and get an idea about what's going on and how when we make additional observations, it gives us information about um, the unseen regions of the functions. And the kernel function is what determines uh, how free the function can be between the known points. So if the kernel function specified a lower covariance, uh, we would get more wiggling. The other thing that goes on here is usually when we observe a point like point one, we don't know it with certainty. There's often measurement error. Um, and so I've put these gray regions on this slide to show you what happens then. Uh, now the, the unknown functions can wiggle around that point, given how much measurement error we might think there is, um, and they don't have to be uh, rigidly affixed to the point in general. And this is the usual situation we're in because um, we have an observation that has some measurement uncertainty to it, uh, or we expect that uh, the, the process is generating a, a scatter of points uh, for that particular uh, location. Uh, and then there's more freedom and even more wiggliness. Uh, but don't worry, Bayes can handle it. Uh, we're going to use basic Bayesian updating to do all this stuff just as before. No new machinery is actually required. You just have to define the model differently. Okay, so here's a, a an example to give you an idea about how this regularizes in continuous space. So I've put in a case here where we've got a point four, which is inconsistent with the others. Points one, two, and three are in a nice uh, line uh, sloping down to the right. Point four is off that trend. And now notice uh, when we ask Bayes to tell us the posterior distribution for this, it, it draws um, curves that are sort of between uh, points one, two, and four, but goes down to three because three is not constrained. Uh, it's locally partial pooling, uh, and one, four, and two are close to one another, and so you get kind of an average of them in between. And on the right here, you keep watching this, I'm going to adjust the covariance. Now the covariance declines faster, and you see that this allows the functions to be wigglier. And then we get less regularization, yeah, because the covariance kernel on the right um, says that at um, uh, d covariance declines faster with distance. And so this allows more wiggliness, and we get less regularization. Uh, here, the maximum covariance is now very low. And again, this leads to more regularization. Um, uh, even though it declines faster. Uh, points don't co-vary that much uh, at all uh, in this uh, particular example. Uh, 
by adjusting the parameters of the covariance kernel, you can get all kinds of different shapes and freedom uh, with this. So yeah, we make the maximum covariance very low, and now the function just becomes an average thing. And then back to the original example that I showed. OK, in truth, we learn the covariance kernel from the sample. It's not something we assume is fixed. We do need priors for it, but that allows a huge number of potential covariance kernels. And the animation I'm showing you here is samples from the prior as we gradually add in three different points, showing you then samples from the posterior distribution of the covariance kernel. So we don't get a, a single covariance kernel at the end of a Gaussian process analysis. We get a posterior distribution of covariance kernels. And I know this is a lot. In the beginning of the course, it was just a posterior distribution of proportions of water on the globe. Pretty soon we had posterior distributions of regression functions. Uh, and now we have posterior distributions of infinite dimensional covariance matrices. Um, I'm not going to apologize uh, because um, I'm giving you superpowers, right? Uh, you should be glad. Uh, but all the same basic Bayesian updating machinery from the very beginning of the course is sufficient to do this as well. You don't have to learn any new tricks, really. Um, so I want you to see here is, is the, the very strong nonlinear relationships between the shape of the covariance kernel and the error variance that's assumed. Uh, so each of these colors is a different sample from the posterior distribution, and but they correspond across the graphs. So you can see if the covariance kernel has a very high um, a maximum covariance, uh, then this also has implications for the amount of for the wiggliness of the curves that are drawn and the amount of error around the observed points uh, that you would estimate. And all of this is inferred jointly in the posterior distribution. It's maybe a little easier to see here if we just examine a single sample from the, I um, mean, it's a sequence of samples. That's what the animation is, but uh, just a single one to reduce the complexity. And uh, you can see as the covariance kernel on the right is um, uh, uh, declines rapidly, you get very wiggly shapes. So watch it again, there'll be a point where it kind of slams itself against the y-axis and then it, the, the curve on the right gets extremely wiggly, like a noise waveform. Um, but then if it's uh, relatively flat, the covariance kernel is relatively flat like there, then you get a smooth um, shape. Okay, so what are these uh, magical uh, kernel functions that draw these covariance curves? Well, you've got lots of options. This is a scientific question, how you want to model this. Um, but again, this is we're talking about macro states. There's a bunch of different microprocesses that are influencing the covariation among these units. And we're not trying to specify a generative model of all those microstates. What we're trying to describe is the macro shape of these things. And so the basic problem is to say, how, what's the shape of decline in covariation? And um, a very common choice, of course, is the Gaussian, because lots of things in nature produce Gaussian relationships. And the, this is the so-called quadratic, or L2, the L2 norm. Um, uh, applied mathematicians would call this a, a covariance kernel. And it's a Gaussian distribution, a sort of folded Gaussian distribution. And what makes it Gaussian is that quadratic term where x1 and x2 are the x locations on the graphs on the previous slides. And we take the difference and square it. And that's, of course, the heart of a Gaussian distribution is this uh, e to the minus x1 minus x2 squared over sigma squared. That's a Gaussian distribution. Um, we'll talk more about this function in a moment. <clears throat> Uh, another really popular choice, and we'll look at this one in the second half of the lecture after the break, is the uh, ornstein uhlenbeck uh, kernel. This is very similar, uh, but it's not Gaussian. Uh, it uh, uh, declines exponentially instead, but we take the absolute value of the difference instead of the square of the difference. And there are natural processes that produce this as well. Um, and then sometimes uh, you have a variable that is periodic, like time of day and you want to model um, behavior, uh, say, of people at different times of day, you don't want to treat time of day as a linear thing. Uh, you have to compute the distances as some periodic function. And in this case, there are periodic kernels like this one that uses a squared sine function to model it. And these are just uh, fantastic. Uh, they work in, in lots of kinds of applications where you have circular kinds of variables like time. Time orientation is another one, right? Which direction something is pointing. These are fundamentally circular uh, variables. Okay, now we need to insert this uh, uh, kernel function into the model. So here's what we're going to say. We're going to use the quadratic uh, 
um, L2 norm function. And what we say is each uh, entry uh, for, for societies ij, the covariance between them is kij. It is going to have some maximum covariance we're going to call eta. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to square this just uh, as a sort of visual reminder to you that it must be positive. Yeah. And then we have the um, uh, quadratic kernel function there, which is minus rho squared. Uh, so you can think of rho squared is 1 over sigma squared in a typical Gaussian uh, version, but it's nicer to write it this way instead of having some divider uh, in your model. And then we multiply this by the square distance between the two islands, which I have given you as a data frame uh, in the rethinking package. So here's the distance matrix in thousands of kilometers. And um, uh, this was loaded when you loaded Klein 2. And uh, we'll talk, look at the code in a moment. Uh, and then we assign some priors for um, eta squared and rho squared. And I'm going to assign eta squared a prior of exponential 2 uh, and rho squared a, a prior of exponential 0.5. Now, what in the world do these priors imply? Well, as always, you, you if you stuck with the course this long, you have a good idea what I'm about to say, you should do a prior predictive simulation. Uh, this, this stuff is way too complicated to intuit um, the effect of the shape of these priors on, on the uh, prior distribution of the covariance functions. And that's what we want to view. We, we, want, we don't want to think about these priors independent of one another. We want to think about them jointly and what they impl imply about possible covariance functions. So let's look at that. <clears throat> Here's a little bit of code um, just to simulate draws from the prior distribution of covariance functions implied by these two priors for eta squared and rho squared. And you can see they imply lots of different covariance functions, some with quite high covariances that sustain for a long time, others that are very low and flat, uh, some with very high covariances initially, but the covariance declines very rapidly with space and so on. Uh, not much um, uh, prior information at all in this. Uh, but it, it, what these priors don't say is that it's, it's not plausible under these priors that um, there's extremely high covariance over many thousands uh, of kilometers of ocean. Okay, now we have our model and we've done the requisite uh, prior predictive simulation. Uh, so um, let's fit to the data. Uh, so here's a little bit of code to do it. There's no big surprises, except there's a little bit of code here that's convenience. Um, instead of having to um, write some code that computes every one of those KIJs yourself, uh, there's a little convenience function in ULAM called cove underscore GPL2, which will do it for you. You just give it the distance matrix, that's capital D here, and the names of the parameters that define um, the kernel, uh, eta squared and rho squared. And then there's a, a fourth one there, 0 0.01, and this is the, the variance around each point from each particular location. Um, this has no effect in this particular model because we only have one observation for each society. But if you had replicates, then you might want to uh, think harder um, about that uh, uh, particular um, uh, parameter and estimate it. And this model samples no problem, and you look at the Precy table, and there's nothing to understand here, right? Uh, with these models, looking at the coefficients is rarely of any value at all. Um, you have to push out posterior predictions to understand what the model thinks. This is the tide machine. Remember, these are the gears of the tide machine, and uh, mortals are not meant to read these things. Okay. What we'd want to do, uh, I think, is a really good idea with uh, all Gaussian process models is you want to compare the the prior for the kernel uh, covariance matrices, uh, covariance functions to the posterior. And that's what I'm doing on the left here. I've drawn some samples from the prior covariance kernels and showing those in black, and then from the posterior in red. And you'd see that uh, uh, we have learned something from the sample here. Uh, the posterior update is that the maximum covariance is low. Um, uh, but you can get, uh, it doesn't necessarily decline that fast. Yeah. Um, you can get uh, substantial covariance uh, uh, over a thousand kilometers away. And then on the right, we've got a more complicated plot. I'm going to zoom in for that and talk you through it. Now, keep in mind, this is just pure spatial covariance here. We haven't tried to explain the covariance in any possible way. And neighboring islands could also have similar populations. And so we're going to deal with that next. Uh, so this is not an estimate of the, uh, of the effect of anything. This is a description of how similar islands are as a function of space. 
And what I've done is I've drawn line segments between pairs of islands and shaded them with the intensity of the covariance in the, in the posterior distribution, the posterior mean covariance uh, among them. And it, so you see that uh, consistent with that posterior distribution of the covariance kernel on the previous slide, um, uh, societies that are near one another, like Malaikula, Santa Cruz, uh, Ticopia, um, are expected to be are more similar, uh, and uh, 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 Lao, Fiji, Tonga as well. And then there's poor Hawaii over there all by itself, um, <laughs> where uh, 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 it also has the most complicated tool set, um, but uh, the covariance function declined so rapidly that there's uh, essentially zero expected similarity between Hawaii and the others. Um, because of spatial effects. Okay, so there's something about space here uh, that matters, and uh, things islands that are closer to one another do have more similar toolkit complexities. That's what this is saying. Now we want to put population size back in this. Remember, that's the whole point. We were trying to deal with space as a confound. We've modeled the space part now and gotten that part of the new machinery to work. And now we got to fold back in the previous bit. And this is the step-by-step -step drawing of the owl, right? And you start with the sketch, uh, draw some circles, uh, sketch in some features, do the detailing. Don't, don't start with detailing, right? So we're going to do some detailing now. I'm going to put population size in. We go back to the model that has um, t hat in it. This uh, Remember this function where we, we have p uh, exponentiated to the b, uh, the el elasticity. And now we're going to put in uh, this these uh, deviations, um, a sub s, as offsets. And But of course, uh, lambda needs to be positive. Uh, so in the log model, it was just a sub s. Uh, but we just exponentiate those, and we get a positive offset. So we can just multiply our previous thing, t hat by e to the alpha sub s, and that's what I've done um, uh, in this model. Yeah. So one way to think about this is that if, if um, uh, alpha sub s is 0, then e to the 0 is 1, and you have exactly the expectation uh, from the um, equilibrium equation we calculated. Yeah, I'll say that again. If alpha sub s is 0, meaning it's just an average island, uh, then e to the 0 is 1, and you get no adjustment uh, to lambda sub i. Yeah, But if it's greater than 1, then it's bigger than expected. And if it's uh, 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 sorry, greater than 0, if alpha sub s is greater than 0, you get more. And if alpha sub s is less than 0, you get less. Uh, otherwise, the code is uh, essentially all the same. Um, and uh, we can run it. <clears throat> And again, we're going to, this time I'm not a, comparing prior to posterior on the left. I'm comparing the empty model, which was the first one we did, which had just the spatial varying effects from the Gaussian process. Uh, those are in black, uh, to the new one with population. And you see what has happened is, as, as is typical with varying effects, I mean, Gaussian processes still draw varying effects. It's just a very fancy um, uh, prior distribution that... Uh, there's less explained by the varying effects. The covariance uh, kernel has a, a smaller uh, maximum covariance now. And that's because population has explained a lot about the similarities in tool sets. Um, and so on the right, I'm trying to show you this again. This is the kind of graph uh, I showed the first time you saw this data set, um, uh, now some number of lectures ago. And uh, where the blue trend is the population expectation, the effective population or log population on the horizontal. Uh, axis and vertical is um, tool uh, set complexity and I'm superimposing across these points the same covariance matrix lines and you still you see that the model still thinks there's something to be explained um, there's there's uh, still some residual similarity among neighboring islands uh, even accounting for population size um, but population size still has a very strong relationship uh, uh, to the outcome okay Hope that was interesting. Uh, I think we should take a break now. Uh, you should probably review the first half, especially the core part, which just explains Gaussian processes in the abstract. Make sure that um, you understand the basics, maybe make a list of what's confusing you, and then take a break, take care of yourself. And when you come back, I will still be here. <laughs>
second half, I want to talk about another major application of Gaussian processes, and that's in the study of the relationships among biological species. What you're looking at here is a, a consensus phylogeny of the primates, uh, the family of uh, mammals that you are a member of. Uh, the primates are very diverse, and they're also a very old group of mammals, in some sense very basal, or pretty simple uh, critters. And uh, uh, they're different groups. Uh, you're an ape, I'm pretty sure. And uh, you can find us here, Homo sapiens, uh, in the group of the apes. The apes have big bodies, uh, no tails, uh, big brains. Um, and they're, for the most part, kind of failures. They've been going extinct at high rates uh, for a long time, even before people arrived. Uh, then you have a very successful group, the uh, African and Asian monkeys, uh, which include macaques, which uh, macaques are just like uh, uh, super mammals. Uh, uh, after humans are gone, macaques will inherit the earth probably. And then uh, American monkeys, uh, these are mostly uh, living in South and Central America, and um, they are almost all arboreal, smaller bodied. Um, you have uh, tarsiers and uh, lemurs, uh, lots and lots of lemurs. Yeah, and uh, all of them living on Madagascar. And then the galagos and lorises, uh, which, um, although they look quite different uh, from people, are very similar um, genetically. So these are the primates, and one of the things evolutionary biologists, especially anthropologists like myself, try to do is use the diversity of primates and uh, to understand uh, evolution, uh, evolution in long-living um, animals that produce uh, small litters of offspring, and that's something that all the primates share, no matter how big they are or where they live. Uh, and that's unusual, actually, uh, just as we are. So there's a lot to learn by studying our relatives, and it, we're going to take an, uh, uh, an extended tour through a particular example so I can teach you how to use Gaussian process regression to deal with what are called phylogenetic confounds. Uh, this is a family of methods that are casually called phylogenetic regression, although I, at this point in the course I'm not even sure what regression means anymore. It's, it has no fixed meaning in statistics. Uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to make good progress. So this data set is in Primates 301 because there's 301 species and the data come from this uh, nice paper by uh, Sally Street and colleagues uh, published in 2017 and the citations on the bottom. Uh, data set is mostly life history traits. Uh, the basic idea is um, what are the relationships, if any, between the size of social groups and the size of brains uh, adjusted for body mass? Um, among primate species. So this relates to a long-standing popular hypothesis that one of the reasons primates have such big brains is that almost all of them are social. Uh, they have long lifespans, they live in groups, and they have small numbers of offspring. Uh, like people, people are just a really extreme exaggeration of a general primate trend. So does the variation among primates support the idea that social group size is actually a cause um, of larger brains. That is that if, you, if you're if uh, you highly social, um, you have new kinds of dynamic problems to solve, and this requires uh, more cortex. Okay, this is a realistic data set. It's a real data set from a real publication, and as such, it's got all of the nice inconvenient features of real data sets. There's a lot of missing data. Uh, not all of the variables we're interested in have been measured for all of the species. Yeah, I mean, how do you think you measure the brain size of a primate? Yeah, it's not something you do with a camera. Um, uh, there's a lot of measurement error uh, on, on some of the variables. And the thing we're gonna deal with is not those two things. We'll think about those two things in a future lecture. Uh, what we're gonna deal with today is unobserved confounding. So uh, let me give you a representation of the missing data issue uh, for now. And this will this will be a foreshadowing for a future lecture where we talk about <clears throat> missing data a little bit more. So here's the full um, consensus phylogeny with all 301 species uh, labeled in color by their major uh, groups. And if I drop out the ones uh, where we don't have um, uh, all three measurements for body mass, um, group size, and and brain size, we're down to 151, essentially half. Uh, so we can take those complete cases and we're gonna do the complete case analysis um, 
uh, today and then in a future lecture we'll talk about uh, doing better uh, than this but we'll do the complete case analysis today by dropping down to the 151 uh, species which are fully observed and I plot out here just as a general sense um, brain volume in field circles uh, scaled by the size of the brain uh, so if you look in on the apes there you'll see that there are some with big brains uh, including us with big filled circles and then there are some with small uh, brains like the the yellow points um, uh, opposite and uh, then there's body mass which is open circles and um, and then the triangles are group size so what you really don't want to do and you know this is peer at this and try to make up a story about covariation we need to do something better something model based with a generative model um, but there's a lot of covariation uh, among these three variables. This is the classic kind of problem from very early in the course. You've got three variables, and they're all related to one another. They're all associated. And there's no way just from the sample alone um, to understand what's causing what. Uh, <clears throat> this is a chance for me to revisit uh, my standard axe and grind it. Uh, evolutionary ecology, like most fields, I don't want to single it out, uh, but, I'm, but here I have to single it out because this is an evolutionary ecology problem. Um, is not very good uh, about thinking causally. And phylogenetic comparative methods that you'll see even in the best evolutionary ecology journals are dominated by a pattern I call causal salad. Causal salad means just tossing stuff into a model and then interpreting every coefficient or every changing coefficient as some causal estimate. And you know this doesn't work for all of the logical reasons I've taught you uh, since very early in the course. Um, and this also goes for things like controlling for phylogeny. Uh, uh, there's a tendency in this literature for people to use predictive criteria like AIC or cross-validation criteria like important sampling as a stand-in for causal inference, real causal inference. And they'll select a model based upon a predictive criterion and then interpret the coefficients causally. And uh, this is very bad news. So this has to get cleaned up. And cleaning up starts with you. Uh, uh, controlling for phylogeny is a phrase used a lot in this literature. Um, it's often required by reviewers and editors, but it's done in a mindless fashion. Um, I'm not against controlling for phylogeny. I'm going to show you uh, a way to do it, uh, but there's no single way to do it because you still have to think causally. Yeah, and that's uh, so. Let me give you an idea what I mean by that. Um, how we could add uh, phylogenetic confounds to a DAG. Um, so the social brain hypothesis is the thing we're talking about here. That's one label for it. The idea that if you live in a larger social group, this, this uh, uh, introduces unique cognitive demands uh, on an individual so that they would benefit from having a larger brain and there over very long time period selection would favor monkeys with larger brains if they lived in larger groups. Um, uh, <clears throat> body mass uh, plausibly influences both of these. And so if you want to uh, estimate the causal influence of group size on brain size, you need to stratify by body mass because it is a confound. It is a fork that points at group size and brain size. But this is an assumption, this DAG structure. Of course, there are lots of other DAG structures which are possible. Um, body mass could mediate, uh, right? Uh, some of it, it could be the group size influences body mass. Um, there could be unobserved uh, confounds between brain size and, and body mass. Um, or there could be reciprocal causation. It could be, in fact, that um, it, for the most part, brain size allows primates to live in larger groups. And so on the right, the arrow goes the other direction. Um, uh, this is just to remind you, uh, I'm going to move forward with the DAG on the left for the sake of the lesson. But just to remind you of, of Nancy Cartwright's law, there's no causes in, no causes out, no interpretation without causal representation. At the end of this lecture, I'm going to revisit this issue a bit uh, and, and suggest some ideas about a good way to go forward with these sorts of complex problems. Um, but let's put that aside for the moment because I want to teach you some technology. OK, back to the simple story here. Let's take this DAG as given uh, for the sake of the analysis. And now what we have to imagine is unobserved variables, which are confounds among these. And it's very likely that there are unobserved confounds here represented by lowercase u, which influence all of these things. And what are these things? They're um, historical environmental variables that are shared among species that live in similar locations. Uh, they're uh, relatedness. Uh, sometimes species are just more similar, have more similar values of these variables g and b, because they diverged very recently. 
uh, and drift or natural selection hasn't had a much time to make them different. Um, and so in a sense, uh, history, uh, and this is history of shared environments, uh, history of, of shared stressors and exposures, um, and history of descent, uh, all influence uh, some big vector of unobserved confounds, lowercase u, and all of those things point into all of our other variables. So obviously uh, this is a bad situation to be in, and it's one of the reasons evolutionary ecologists realized a very long time ago that naive regression um, on uh, the traits of uh, living species is not a great way to understand what's going on, <clears throat> or at least it has. <clears throat> it is a great way to learn what's going on, and you should absolutely do it, but you should do it in a subtle way that uh, is conspicuously aware of historical uh, relationships. And that doesn't just mean phylogeny in the strict sense, but it means uh, shared environmental exposures as well. I think I want to draw this out some more, so bear with me. We're going to get back to the data set uh, soon. Um, it's a nice idea to think about that phylogenetic influence, this historical influence, is not magic. It's not some sauce that's poured over the species and it makes them more similar, and, and we have to deal with that and somehow control for it. You can draw it on a DAG. There's nothing magical or weird about it at all. It's just it's you need a DAG with time points, uh, that is, the values of traits at different points in time. So here's the first time I'm going to show you an example of something like this. This is a time series DAG in phylogenetic context, and, and it's complicated, but I'm going to do it step by step so you understand what's going on. Imagine some, uh, way back in time, there's some primordial primate, the Ur primate, and it has some uh, group size G sub 1 and some uh, uh, body size B sub 1, where the 1 refers to the species as an index for the species. And we're going to move up this slide in time yeah, to future values of these same variables. Yeah. So uh, then there's some speciation, and now we have two different primate species, um, 1 and 2, and their traits are labeled with subscripts 1 and 2. Uh, and the new row I've added ab above the very bottom one is the later point in time. And so what the arrows are drawn so you can see that, um, so we're gonna assume that group size influences brain size, but not the reverse. Uh, but obviously the previous group size, uh, way back in time, influences the group size now. Yeah, uh, because it can only change at some certain rate. And, uh, uh, and that's what you see. Um, uh, group size uh, G sub 1 at the very bottom influences G sub 1 and G sub 2 in the second row uh, for both species, right, because they're descended from a common ancestor. And the same for uh, brain size, B sub 1 uh, influences B sub 1 and B sub 2 in the second row. And then those red arrows indicate uh, the causal effect of group size on brain size, yeah, and they cross right over. So group size at time 1 influences both of those. And we can keep this uh, uh, Thing going in time, uh, so more time passes, there's not another speciation event, we still only have uh, two primates, but one of them changes. Uh, so I've changed its icon, uh, species one. It continues to evolve. It has a new group size and a new brain size, um, but it's only the most recent um, row, row two, that influences row three, right? It's not possible for the, the values way, way back in time uh, to exert causal force on the most recent ones. And this is the sense in which there's a time series analysis here. There's some dynamic evolutionary process. Now this would actually be better to represent in continuous time. And I'll mention this again at the very end, but this is a schematic to give you an idea of what we mean when we talk about phylogenetic causation. And it's not magical at all. Uh, it's just a dynamical systems model. Uh, close out the example. We can get another speciation event there. Now we have species three. Um, which shares the most recent common ancestor with uh, species one. And, but again, uh, all the red arrows and such are consistent with the basic DAG, uh, but they only apply to the most recent time. The problem we're faced with um, in real research is that we only get to observe the tips, and the evolutionary history is unknown to us. But it would be good to know uh, because if we knew all the values uh, going back in time, we could do standard backdoor criterion analysis and know what we needed to stratify by, and there'd be nothing mysterious and weird about this at all. But since we don't know that, uh, we're, we're back in this position like with the oceanic islands, where there's a bunch of stuff that could have happened in the past, all these micro histories that could have happened. Um, uh, and they've influenced some macro state, that is the pattern of covariation among the observed uh, living species. And we want to uh, somehow uh, 
model uh, those macro states in a way that is responsible and averages over uh, the large number of possible histories that could have happened. Um, and there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, the most common way is uh, got a couple of, of um, simultaneous uh, problems, uh, and we use we use them together uh, to make a, a, some possible solution. <clears throat> and that is uh, phylogenetic regression. So the idea is first, we want to infer the history from the current um, traits uh, uh, values. Uh, and this is a, a part of evolutionary biology called phylogenetics, phylogenetic inference. And, uh, and then the second is, uh, after you've done some inference of the history um, among these species, that is the pattern of branching influences uh, uh, when they diverge from one another, how do you use it to model causes or to control for unobserved confounds? So let me say a little bit more about each of these in turn. So the first one, uh, what is the history? This is a very hard problem. Uh, it's a long-standing problem in evolutionary biology. And I want to say from the outset, uh, it's a very unresolved field still, even though it's a very big field and it's central to the um, project of evolutionary biology. Uh, and it's unresolved because it's very, very hard. And there are lots of inferential problems attached to it. It's gotten a lot better recently with the advent of modern genomics. It's gotten very cheap to just sequence whole genomes. And we understand a lot more about rates of evolution, of molecular evolution, and this has helped a lot. Uh, but big challenges remain here. Um, even in the best cases, there's huge uncertainty. And uh, part of that uncertainty arises from the fact that uh, we don't really understand all the details of these evolutionary processes. Um, many species that evolved are leave no trace, and, and that makes it hard to understand things like diversification and extinction. Uh, you just can't get it from extant species. It's, it's just not a solvable problem. And the evolutionary process, whatever it is, is not stationary. It changes over time. Uh, and the big problem, of course, is that usually in this literature, the goal is to, is to infer a single phylogeny, a so-called resolved phylogeny for all traits. But this does not, by the basic principles of evolutionary theory, exist at all. Uh, and it's because different parts of the genome can have different evolutionary histories. I'll say that again. Different parts of the genome can have different evolutionary histories. And so if you insist for a large group of species on a single tree, chances are none of the traits will fit the tree exactly at all. And there's nothing mysterious about that. It's just how evolution works. There's this thing called crossing over. Yeah, uh, and that changes. I mean, then the whole structure of the genome changes over evolutionary time at a, a pretty startling rate. And so it gets very difficult to even know how to align different genomes of species that are distantly related to one another. A lot of these... Uh, sounds like I'm complaining, but I'm not. What I'm trying to say is if you're a hardworking and creative person, you can make a really big impact on addressing major inferential problems in evolutionary biology by focusing on phylogenetic inference and moving away from the single tree obsession. Yeah. Um, statistically, a big problem is exploring tree space. Uh, tree space is really big. There are many different branching configurations. It's like network inference. Yeah. And... Um, uh, we really don't have good algorithms uh, for exploring tree space, and this remains another area where applied mathematicians who are interested could make huge contributions. Okay, there's also um, a very small tribe of folks, uh, some of them at my own institute, who uh, construct cultural and linguistic phylogenies. Uh, and I think this is an area that has a lot of promise, but it's even more sort of unresolved than um, uh, ordinary uh, biological phylogenetics. Uh, among those that do it, uh, there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, uh, and, uh, but among folks who don't do it, uh, basically very few people find it convincing. And one of the main reasons is because um, uh, they're using genomic software, ordinary software for biological uh, phylogenetic inference to do inference of cultural histories, and obviously the, you need different assumptions. Uh, there's... Um, Culture doesn't evolve like genes. Yeah, this is not a, a thing that anybody's going to argue with. And so you have to squint really hard and um, uh, uh, really, really hard uh, to interpret such phylogenies as the history of, of traits. Um, so, for example, languages uh, uh, languages are kind of like sociological fictions, right? And what a linguistic phylogeny really is is a phylogeny of a very tiny core amount of vocabulary that is specifically chosen because it's 
not borrowed at the high rates of most of the features of languages. Nevertheless, core vocabulary is also borrowed, and uh, often quite a lot. English is a startling example where a lot of our core vocabulary uh, comes from other languages like, like Old Norse, right? The word sky in English is, is um, borrowed from Norse. And uh, dealing with those issues is something that uh, requires new inferential tools, but there aren't a lot of people working on such new inferential tools. So to be clear, I'm not against this research. I just think it's, uh, want to make it clear that, that there's a lot to do. And if you're an inventive, uh, energetic, creative person, you can have a really big impact by working on inference in these areas. Um, remind you of this basic truth that was also true of social networks. Phylogenies don't exist. Yeah. Uh, uh, every molecule in biology will have a different evolutionary history. Uh, what we do with phylogenies, like with social networks, is we're trying to, to do some regularization, some data reduction. To make, we have a very complicated um, set of observations, uh, like a genome, and we're trying to reduce that down to some course description that we can do some work with, that we can understand. But we should never make the mistake of believing that there is a phylogeny. Yeah. Uh, it's just not true. Species themselves are kinds of fictions, right? They're ephemeral things through evolution that come and go. And, um, and that's fine. Uh, there's no big problem with that. Uh, we can use these latent constructions like phylogenies um, to do really good work and learn a lot about evolutionary history without believing that they exist in some like unique truth way. Yeah, uh, there's no problem with that at all. But that means um, we've got choices to make, right? What do we want to do with this phylogeny since there's no true one? And uh, how do we want to infer it? <clears throat> but I'm going to skip, we're going to skip over that because uh, uh, it, would, it would take me many lectures to teach you phylogenetic inference. So let's move to the second part of this. Say we have a phylogeny. Uh, now, what do we do with it? Um, and there's no universally correct approach here because as I hope I convinced you with that uh, DAG example, it depends upon the nature of the traits and how they influence one another over time. Uh, the, the rate of speciation and extinction and all of that stuff will determine through the backdoor criterion what we need to adjust by um, uh, to do things, right? So if we knew the full evolutionary history, had the full phylogeny and all the internal trait states, um, like in that one slide where I drew out the, the three mythical primate species, um, we could just use ordinary new calculus to figure out the right thing to do. And sometimes you don't need to adjust your history at all. It's, it's just not necessary. And other times you will need to, but you won't, you, you'd want to do it with one particular set of traits and not others. Uh, so there's no universally correct approach here. Uh, so what's often done, and I don't think this is a, a bad idea, but we just have to keep in mind that it's, it's, not a, it's not magic that always solves the problem, is to do a Gaussian process regression where we use the phylogeny to think about distances uh, between species and use that as a proxy um, for shared confounds. So here's the idea. Uh, I'm going to have to build in some new machinery here and I'll show you how to do it. We're going to start by forgetting about phylogeny for a second and just think about an ordinary linear regression where we would try to deal with this DAG on the right, right, where we've got this confound M and we want to stratify by it. So we make a linear regression with brain size as the outcome. We're trying to estimate, estimate the causal effect of G of group size. And we also stratify by M body mass at the same time. And this is what the model looks like. We did this uh, many weeks ago, right? What I want to show you now is that you can always re-express a linear regression of this type with a multivariate normal outcome distribution. I'll say that again. You can always replace a linear regression uh, where there's a normal distribution assigned to each individual outcome, in this case, B sub I. You can always replace this with an equivalent notational model where the outcome is multivariate normal at top. And uh, you notice I've taken the, the subscript I off of the B up top, and that means it's the whole vector B. It's all species. And so what we're saying is all of the species in the data set, in this case, all 151, there, there were 301, but we dropped a bunch of them because we didn't even have brain sizes for them. Um, all of them come from some multivariate normal distribution uh, with some vector of means mu and some covariance matrix, capital K. And so now you get, this is the foreshadowing, there's gonna be a Gaussian process there, but hang on, not just yet. Um, each element of the vector of means mu uh, is the same as before. There's no new action there, not yet. Um, 
and then the uh, covariance matrix uh, is is this weird thing capital I times sigma squared and what does that mean well capital I in matrix algebra is the identity matrix yeah it's it's the matrix version of the number one yeah you multiply a matrix uh, by the um, uh, by the identity matrix and you get the same matrix back yeah that's the point and so uh, the identity matrix times sigma squared just gives you um, this covariance matrix where there are no correlations, no covariances uh, in the off diagonal, and then you have the same variance in every element. So this is why it's a standard linear regression, because this is the same assumption of a standard linear regression. It's just a different and uh, perhaps uh, annoying notation, um, but it's going to be very convenient for specifying the Gaussian process, uh, because the Gaussian process is uh, specifies all these covariances, and we're going to fill in those zeros um, with non-zeros. Okay, but let me show you the code to do this. Uh, so um, on the left, I show you what I call the classical regression form. There's no new surprises here. The uh, B tilde normal. So each element in B has a normal distribution with mean, mu, and sigma. Um, but then on the right, I show you the multivariate form. Uh, and you just replace normal with multinormal, and you uh, insert this matrix K now. Um, and uh, it's a matrix which has dimensions of the same number of rows as there are species and the same number of columns as there are species. So in this case, it's 151 by 151 sized matrix. Yeah, don't worry, no problem. Your computer can handle it. And it's defined uh, as uh, the, um, uh, the identity matrix, which, which I pass in as data. You'll see in the dat list on the left where I define it. Um, uh, times the variance sigma squared. And uh, these models run no problem, um, and they give you exactly the same inference. Yeah, they're equivalent. <clears throat> okay, but the one on the right is going to be easier to specify a Gaussian process in, so that's what we're going to do now. You want to think about these un unobserved confounds, like each species i has some use of i, uh, which is uh, adjusting the expectation. Um, it's like a residual. And those residuals are correlated across species in a way that's patterned after their evolutionary histories, their shared evolutionary histories. And so we'd like to get that phylogenetic information about their uh, evolutionary distance from one another um, into that covariant structure. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the background to this in an animated way is to think about that, that Covariance among species arises from lots of possible microhistories, as I said at the start of this uh, section, and a combination of a branching structure of a phylogeny, like the one shown on the on the screen here, and an evolutionary process, which means uh, rates of change, um, rates of innovation among traits, the rates at which some traits transition to other traits, will produce patterns of covariances at the tips. I'll say this again: a combination of a tree structure. Uh, like this one, uh, which represents the history of bifurcations when different groups became um, uh, largely reproductively isolated from one another, and an evolutionary process, which includes assumptions about rates of change and other things, will together give you um, a distribution of covariances at the tips. And that's the macro state we can use um, to do some deconfounding, even though we're, we can't learn all those micro details. Yeah. Uh, so for this particular tree structure, what I want you to see is that there's lots of bifurcations near the tips, right? There's not much action. So the diversification rate is lower in this. And so you uh, have lots of, of splitting all through um, the phylogeny. And then if we start doing an evolutionary simulation on this for some uh, arbitrary innovation rate, you'll see that closely related species are more similar to one another. That's what the, the, the colors indicate particular trait values. Yeah, but for any particular simulation, uh, you get different outcomes, uh, but it's possible for us uh, uh, to specify for any particular tree structure and assumptions about evolutionary rates what um, the distribution of covariances at the tips will look like. So if you, you make an assumption that the tree looks differently, here's a tree where there's lots of bifurcation in deep time. You look in the middle of the circle, yeah, and you see lots of uh, splitting. Uh, and then you run the same evolutionary process on this tree, you get a different pattern of covariation at the tips, yeah, uh, because there's lots of time on those long branches uh, for other changes to happen. Uh, and you get different patterns of covariation. Yeah, essentially less covariation. Okay, <clears throat> let me try to summarize. The idea is uh, if you, you 
have some evolutionary model, a range of evolutionary models, and some trees, uh, some tree structure, this will imply patterns of covariation at the tips. And that pattern of covariation at the tips is what we want to use as a proxy for the unobserved confounds. And the idea is that the covariance declines with phylogenetic distance. And so if we can use the tree structure to measure phylogenetic distance, um, which in, in the simplest sense just means the branch length from one species to another. That means you put your finger on one species at a tip and then you move in the tree, down into the tree along branches, and then back up on the shortest path uh, to some other species. That's the phylogenetic distance. Uh, there are other phylogenetic distance concepts, but I don't want to get uh, uh, too into the weeds in this lecture. Okay. Then you need to assume something about rates of change. Um, because that'll specify how the covariance declines, right? It could be that it doesn't take very long for evolution to make species essentially independent of one another, meaning that there's essentially no expected covariation. Or it could be that evolution is very slow or that um, envir shared environments are maintained over very long evolutionary time uh, due to niche maintenance. And both of those sorts of mechanisms would give us higher expected covariances over longer evolutionary distances. Uh, so the simplest sort of model, the oldest, is the so-called Brownian motion model where you expect a linear relationship between phylogenetic distance and covariance uh, between species. And uh, another, which I think is, is uh, increasingly common, and, and at least in the literature I read, basically replaced Brownian motion, is the Ornstein-Uhlenbeck uh, uh, one. I know these things named after people are terrible, right? Um, and both of these, uh, Brownian and Ornstein-Uhlenbeck, are actually named after people. Um, the, the Ornstein Uhlenbeck is, is a so-called damped Brownian motion model. So in the, in the Brownian motion model, you're just uh, getting deviations that are drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And, and so traits wander over time In Ornstein Uhlenbeck that happens too, but there's kind of a gravitational attractor that, um, pulls uh, large deviations back towards some mean. Um, and so this means you get, uh, um, a different shape uh, that I'm showing you there on the right, uh, <clears throat> this so-called L1 norm is what it's called. <clears throat> so let me show you what this looks like. So here's our multivariate normal version of the basic regression that includes um, group size and body mass. And what we want to do is define uh, the covariance matrix using a Gaussian process, but we're going to use the ornstein uhlenbeck kernel. To remind you, the ornstein uhlenbeck kernel just uses the absolute value of the distance between the two species, but otherwise it looks just like the one we used in the Oceanic Societies one. There's just no square there on dij, where dij is the phylogenetic distance between species i and j. Eta squared has the same meaning as before, and rho doesn't exactly have the same meaning as before, but it is a parameter that, it, that specifies the rate at which covariance declines with increasing distance. And again, we have some priors, um, and I've, I've uh, specified some new ones here uh, for eta squared and rho. And as always, you want to do prior predictive simulation with these Gaussian process models, because there's just no way for a mortal to intuit the implications of these things. Uh, so here's what we get. Here's uh, prior, prior simulations for the covariance kernel from these priors. And you'll see there's a uh, these priors expect some phylogenetic covariance uh, at for short distances, and they expect it by the time you get to the maximum. Uh, this is scaled phylogenetic distance here. One means the maximum in the tree. Um, by the time you get to the most distant related primates, you don't expect uh, there to be much uh, phylogenetic uh, covariance at all. Uh, but there's a lot of variation in how strong um, the covariance is and how quickly it declines. You could try other priors here and play around with it and redo the analysis, and that's often a very good thing to do uh, because who knows uh, what these priors should look like. I think this is a very understudied area. Okay, <clears throat> so let's start with a model where we don't have predictor variables in the equation for mu sub i. So I've replaced mu sub i just with an intercept alpha, which is just like the average brain size across all primates. And now we're going to just try to get the Gaussian process to work. And when you do your own research, I really encourage you to do it this way uh, so that you get the, the hardest part of the model, the machinery working first, and then you put in the easy parts, which are just regressions, right? Re regression um, uh, variables and coefficients. But the Gaussian process part is trickier. Try to get that functioning first. So here's the code. Um, there's nothing too fancy here. Uh, it's the same sort of stuff as before. Um, 
Notice that uh, here's our matrix uh, for K. It's a 151 by 151 matrix uh, for the species. And there's another convenience function for doing, um, for calculating each covariance from the regression, from the, from the kernel. Uh, but it's, uh, this time it's covariance underscore GPL1 for the L1 norm. That's what, again, applied mathematicians call uh, ornstein uhlenbeck um, Otherwise, it's, it's very similar. Um, uh, no new tricks. Okay, so we run this model. You won't have any trouble getting it to work. And now we look at the difference between the prior and the posterior in the covariance, and you'll see that uh, this model has learned that there's um, uh, less uh, uh, phylogenetic covariance than was expected in the prior. So the, the data really have done something uh, in the updating here, right? So the, the blue samples are from the posterior, and the black ones are from the prior. Uh, I should say from this, uh, it's lower on average, but you'll notice it declines quite slowly. So um, there's lots of, of covariance, uh, even among more uh, quite distantly related species. But notice, we haven't explained brain size at all. This is just saying that there's similarity at mid phylogenetic range uh, in primates uh, for brain size. Okay, now we get back to the estimate. We want to estimate uh, the causal effect of uh, group size, and we're going to simultaneously stratify by body mass. And uh, so we just add those back into the equation for mu, uh, no surprises at all. And now we have three posteriors uh, to compare. Well, one prior and two posteriors, but remember priors and posteriors are all the same sort of thing. Um, the prior is just the posterior when you haven't seen any data yet. Yeah. Uh, so the prior in black uh, that we started with, the, the posterior um, uh, in blue from the previous model, sort of so-called empty model where we didn't have any predictor variables. And now what we expect is when we add predictors is they should explain away some of that covariation among species with other traits like group size or body mass. And you'll see that's exactly what happened. Uh, now the, the red samples from the posterior are very low. There's very little phylogenetic covariance remaining after uh, in brain size after accounting for uh, these traits uh, in this particular model with these assumptions be nice to look at the um, posterior distributions of the regression coefficient of interest so there's a coefficient that um, measures uh, the the um, influence of group size on brain size having accounted for uh, in some sense uh, the unmeasured confounds u and um, and body mass M, and you'll see the it declines as a consequence of including the uh, phylogenetic information. Uh, the black posterior distribution on the right is the so-called ordinary regression. If you just do a, a regression without the Gaussian process in it, you'll get that estimate. And then once we put the Gaussian process in, it essentially has uh, the expectation, yeah, and gets lower. But it's still mostly positive. <clears throat> okay. So that's a crash intro to phylogenetic regression, which is a, a very common technique. And there are lots of packages which essentially automate it. And in that automation, they make it very difficult for novices to learn what's actually being assumed. And the goal of this has been to give you some idea about what's actually going on there and to demystify it and hopefully bring home to you too that there's nothing forcing you to do it. It's just another particular causal model. It's kind of madly clutching at vapors of information about evolutionary history to try to do some kind of modest control for a problem that we know exists. Um, there's some additional problems uh, in this area if you if you stick around with phylogenetic regression that you can find solutions to. The first is we don't really know the phylogeny, and in the previous model, um, I just used a single phylogeny. But of course, you can have a posterior distribution of phylogenies, uh, and you can make it work just as well. Yeah, uh, ideally, you'd want to do phylogenetic inference simultaneous to inferring the causal effect of traits on one another. That would be the best option. Um, uh, but you don't always have to do the best option. You just have to do the better one. Uh, but there are definitely ways to deal with phylogenetic uncertainty. The easiest being you draw phylogeny from the posterior, you run the model, uh, and then you do this over and over and over again for different phylogenies drawn from the posterior distribution of phylogenies. And then you look at the distribution of effects estimated. Uh, that's not the best thing to do, uh, but it's a good thing to do. It's better than using a single phylogeny. Um, and then second, uh, we should be a bit bothered by the idea that uh, causal influences are only uh, one direction. So in the diagram uh, that I'm repeating on the right of this slide, I've drawn it like 
uh, group size influences brain size, but never the reverse. Uh, but this this is exceedingly uh, implausible if you if you're an evolutionary biologist, right? I mean, it's nothing to do specifically with group size and brain size. But there are a bunch of problems here, um, uh, even ones I don't want to talk about too much. Like, for example, is group size an inherited trait? Uh, no, it's it's some sociological outcome that has to do with lots of ecological circumstances. It's it's not heritable in the ordinary sense, like like a physiological trait, like leg length. Yeah, but leaving that aside. Um, it's likely that there's lots of reciprocal causation in these systems because organisms are complicated machines. So let me use an engineering metaphor for a second. <clears throat> if you were um, studying gliders, uh, uh, and gliders can be designed in lots of different ways. They have varying wing lengths and cockpit sizes and overall masses and, and uh, lengths of the fin and so on. And you wanted to understand that variation. Um, you would use engineering principles to do it. You wouldn't use regression, right? And, and the reason is because all of these things are sort of co-constraining under the, um, the design goals of an engineer, yeah, or which gliders crash because they were designed badly and therefore no one builds ones like that again, uh, right? If you, if you increase the size of the cockpit, you've got to change the wings uh, and then you've got to counterbalance it with some weight at the back of the plane and so on. And uh, there's no sense in which... Uh, uh, any of these things has a purely one directional influence on the others, they're all kind of jointly constrained by the optimality criteria designing the whole glider, yeah, to make it a good machine. Um, and it's not that that gliders are optimal in any one case, but uh, there's optimization that goes on in their design. And so there's lots of feedbacks. You change one thing, you've got to change lots of other things. And organisms are similar. Uh, to the extent that organisms are designed by natural selection, and I think there's lots of evidence that they are, um, although they're not perfect, uh, there's lots of joint constraint and optimization. If one thing changes because of some particular selection pressure, other things uh, often need to change to adjust to that. Yeah, And so uh, a hedgehog is like a glider uh, in the sense that um, uh, it's a complex machine and it has lots of, of highly adapted features that are co-adapted to one another. All right. It's just not a random assembly. Whatever you think about hedgehogs, whether you like them or not, I quite like them. Um, they're not just a random assembly of, of kinds of traits of leg lengths and so on. Yeah, they're a functional whole. And so when we model machines like this, it's, regression is probably a bad choice just to start. Yeah, it's just not the right idea. Instead, you want to think about uh, some continuous optimization problem where the traits are adjusting to one another given some overall uh, objective function. And in biology, often that would be survival uh, and, and uh, lineage growth. Um, and for gliders, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but So there are options, and I just want to point you to two uh, relatively recent papers which approach this whole thing from a different perspective uh, than ordinary uh, cross-sectional regression. Uh, the first on the left um, uh, uh, by Eric Ringen and colleagues, came out in 20, uh, 2021, used as a continuous time ODE approach to this, thinking about how traits influence one another through time. So you can have all kinds of feedbacks, um, and they put um, uh, phylogenetic history into this as well. And then on the right, uh, this, this fantastic paper from uh, uh, Mauricio uh, Gonzalez Ferrero uh, and Andy Gardner, um, doing an optimal life's history approach for human evolution, where you think about um, rates of maturation in different tissues of the body and the size of the brain is all being jointly constrained uh, uh, by some uh, future objective function. And then they, they do statistics with this. They fit it to data. Uh, this is the future, is stuff like this, uh, not phylogenetic regression, as I have explained it to you in this lecture. That's my opinion. Okay. Let me try to sum up. Gaussian processes this is a really big area of research in machine learning now. Gaussian processes are everywhere and they're used for tons of things. Uh, they're really fantastic for prediction, uh, but we can use them in causal inference situations as well because often we need to infer some kind of smooth function that is partially pooled um, across some continuous uh, distance variable. Uh, and this is a really fantastic choice. Um, they don't overfit and they give you lots of options for modeling complex phenomena. Uh, of course, they're really, really general, so it's it's sometimes hard to put constraints on them in particular ways, um, but there are options for that as well. Uh, um, 
They're very sensitive to their priors, and so prior predictive simulation is really essential, and this is the case where the quality assurance and testing uh, that we've been doing all along is, is, uh, really pays off. Okay, there's a big uh, universe of these things too. Uh, suppose you had multiple distances, um, right? It wasn't just space, but you also had cultural history in the case of the Oceanic Islands. You could use them both in the same model. Uh, there's this method called automatic relevance determination. Uh, it, this is just a, a Gaussian process where you have multiple distance metrics inside of it. And um, you can also use Gaussian processes when you have uh, vector outcomes. Uh, that is, uh, say for each oceanic island, for example, um, there was a, a vector of cultural features and you know that those features co-varied with one another because they fit together in particular ways. So say these are the individual tools on each island and you, you give them actual names and study their mechanical properties and you don't expect substitutes to occur on the same islands and so you expect a particular uh, pattern of presence and absence to co-vary across societies. Uh, you can address this with this thing called a multi-output Gaussian process. In the biological example, this would be you want to study multiple traits at the same time, and you expect them to have some covariant structure. Uh, this would be getting closer um, to a better solution that isn't just a simple uh, um, linear regression that has directional uh, causal effects. Instead, you're predicting patterns of association uh, with, uh, across species where their feedbacks have produced uh, those patterns of association. Uh, Gaussian processes are used constantly every day. They're a workhorse piece of your life. Your cell phone is probably running one, uh, something called a Kalman filter. Uh, they're used for real-time navigation, for radar, for all kinds of stuff. Gaussian processes are useful and apply anytime there's some unknown um, underlying function. Uh, it could be a, a velocity, a movement path of a vehicle, for example, uh, and there's measurement uncertainty on top of it. And they learn incredibly fast uh, the functions underneath. Um, so, so they're, they're just a workhorse thing that's everywhere in our world, but they're hidden from you if you're not trained to recognize them. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, for pushing through this far. And, uh, we're going to continue into next week by looking at some of the most commonplace problems in applied research. Uh, and I always feel guilty, uh, not having done these, uh, this topic earlier in the course, but measurement error and missing data are present in almost all real research problems. Um, and now you have the statistical muscle to deal with them. So I hope to see you next week and I'll show you how.